Hey all, welcome back to the channel. In the past, I made my very first wooden PC case that featured curves. This case had a prominent rounded edge on the front. However, I wasn't very satisfied with the look as by rounding over the board, you expose the end grain. The exposed end grain breaks the illusion of one continuous piece of wood. This was why I started using beveled edges as it gives a waterfall effect where it looks like one continuous board. I knew of two methods to create bent wood. The first was laminating multiple sheets of thin veneer into a curved shape. This option was quickly dismissed after I discovered how expensive veneers cost. The second method is curve bending. Curve bends are done by cutting multiple grooves in the wood while leaving a thin layer on the front. The thin layer can then easily be bent into the desired shape. I did not like this method of bending wood due to the gaps it left in the final piece. I then stumbled upon this video which showed a method of curve bending using a tapered bit which meant there was no large gaps on the finished piece. I researched further into the method and used an online calculator to help me figure out the cut dimensions. With the theory figured out, I started to do some experimenting with some cheap pine wood. As you can see, the thin layer left behind is already flexible even before we steam it. Steaming the wood further softens it and allows for easy bending. The bent piece is then clamped in place and allowed to cool. This is where I notice something off with the calculations. The curve gaps did not fully close at 90 degrees and needed to be bent further before they close. I had to experiment a few more times before I got the spacing just right. With the trial sorted, I now needed to get my lumber. For this project, I really wanted to work with American Walnut as I think its dark colour and beautiful graining would be perfect for the team I have in mind. The board I ended up picking had this section of interesting grain pattern which I wanted to feature on this case. I trimmed off the end section that was too porous. The center groove was carved before the board was cut to its final width as this allows the router to be more stable on the larger surface. I used a scrap piece of walnut to test the bending properties of the wood. It ended up requiring longer steaming time as it was stiffer than the pine. I then realized that the wood did not bend on the same tangential radius as model. It ends up creating a shallower bend instead. This was adjusted in my design to compensate. Next, I carved out two grooves for the brass inlays. Then, both inner edges were given a 6mm chamfer. I then started on the tapered cuts for the bend. This was pretty nerve wracking as one mistake here and I would have to start all over again. Thankfully, the cuts came out good and I can breathe a sigh of relief. I used an X-Acto knife to clean up some of the tear out. And we're back to the kitchen to give this wood a good steam. I made sure to let the wood get really soft and even brush the surface with hot water to prevent the surface from cracking. These steps were repeated for the other bend. Before gluing up the bends, I pre-drilled some mounting holes for a part later. After the wood had cooled down overnight, 
I then filled the gaps with glue and held them in place. Here's a quick tip. If you have small gaps in your project, you can fill them with wood glue and sprinkle sawdust from the same wood into them. This conceals it pretty well. While the frame was drying, I worked on the power button. In the past, I would typically mount an off-the-shelf power button onto my case and call it a day. But this time, I wanted to try something different. I used my laser cutter to cut out a circular piece of walnut which I then glued in a brass rod. The brass rod was positioned 1mm from the surface of the wood as I wanted to create a concave button. The piece was mounted to the drill press and then sanded to have a concave surface. This concave surface just feels right when depressing the button. The excess rod was sawn off and then filed flat. Keep watching to see how this will fit into the case. The center panel was cut using my X2 D1 Pro. And the excess was trimmed off the mainframe using the panel as a measure. As the router left circular grooves for the inlay, a small chisel was used to give them a pointed tip. The brass inlay was then filed to the same angle. The curve bending does leave creases at the tips of each groove. These are smoothed over with extensive sanding. Some super glue was used to attach the brass inlays. The excess was cut off using a hacksaw and then filed flush with the case. I glued 180 grit sandpaper onto a piece of flat scrap to use as a sanding block for the inlays. I also sanded the rest of the case at this stage. Mounting holes for the rear panel are drilled and threaded inserts installed. Onto the power button, a stepped hole was drilled. A smaller hole fits the standard 16mm momentary push button and the walnut button will be glued on top of it. Before I stain the parts, I needed to smooth over some edges. Here's another tip. You can wrap sandpaper around a file to get into tighter spots. The birch plywood panels were first stained with a walnut shade to better match the main frame. I then glued on the button so that it could be stained together with the frame. While I wanted the wood to look dark to contrast better against the brass, I did not want to hide the natural grain of the walnut. This is why I first apply a coat of clear wax followed by coats of black tinted wax. The first clear layer prevents the following tinted layers from penetrating too deep into the wood which will cover the natural patterns of the wood. While I leave the frame to dry, I started on the aesthetic mods for the components. First up is the power supply. While the pictures on the internet made me think this was an all black unit, it actually has a grey fan which would not go well with this team. I had to take it apart to paint the fan black instead. Masking tape was used to cover the rest of the fan that was already black. Some blue tack was used to cover the gap between the fan blade and its hub, as you don't want paint going in there. 
I know painting fan blades is not typically recommended as it messes with its balance. But in this case, I think the risk is worth it. I made sure to apply a very light coating to reduce the amount of weight added. Next, I carefully painted the embossed logo with gold paint. As I wanted the logo to face upwards in my case, I flipped it from its original positioning. This proved to be an issue as the mounting holes were not symmetrical on both sides. To get around this, I masked off all the components in the unit as I will be drilling new mounting holes and would not want metal dust shorting out any of the parts inside. As the metal was too thin to tap threads into, I glued M3 nuts on the inside instead. Success! Now the logo faces up and I am able to secure the cover back on. Next up was a CPU cooler. ID Cooling kindly provided me their IS55 model for this build. However, the black and silver sticker would clash with the team. To get around this, I first filled in the divot on the fan hub with super glue and baking soda to give myself a flat surface to work with. Liquid mask is then painted around the rim of the hub to prevent paint from getting there. More masking tape was used to cover the rest of the fan before painting. First, a base layer of filler primer was used to smooth out any imperfections. Then, a coat of matte black paint is applied. I then used the laser cutter to cut out a stencil from masking tape. The stencil is then carefully applied onto the hub making sure it's centered. Now, a coat of gold paint can be sprayed over it. Finally, we can peel away the liquid mask and stencil to reveal the paint job. The next component was the motherboard. ASUS kindly provided me their Z790i gaming for this build. The board is beautiful but has multiple silver accents. Well, you know the drill. First, I cut out some panels from 1.5mm walnut plywood to cover the M.2 heat sinks. It will be interesting to see if these impact the drive temperatures later on. I stained the panels black to match the darker theme of the board. To convert the silver lines on the grill, I first painted the whole thing gold. Then, thin strips of masking tape was cut and applied onto each line that I wanted to keep gold. This was an extremely tedious process. Shout out to all the miniature model painters out there. Then, the grill can be painted black. And when that paint is dry, I can remove all 48 pieces of masking tape to reveal the gold accents. I also made a cover plate for the power cables using more walnut plywood and 3D printed brackets. As the black tinted wax was also applied onto the inlay during the previous steps, I had to mask off the inlay again and rub off this layer of wax to reveal a nice shine on them. And here is what we have. The case is looking good, so let's get started on the building. The grill goes back onto the motherboard. The plywood panels are attached with double sided tape. A thanks to Team Group for sending me a set of T Create Expert DDR5 RAM to match the theme of the build.
the i7-1200K I chose will be a big upgrade for my previous PC. CPU heatsink is installed followed by the fan. The 30cm double reverse PCIe extension was used for this configuration. Standoffs are installed to separate the motherboard from the panel. and 10mm standoffs were used to mount the GPU end. The 8-pin and 24-pin cables had to be inserted onto the motherboard at this stage. The cover plate is screwed onto the mainframe. And now we can slide in the center panel. Here is the component that inspired this whole build, the ASUS ProArt RTX 4070 Ti. Big thanks to ASUS for supporting the channel by providing the unit for this project. I was drawn to the ProArt series of graphics cards as they have a minimalist design which is something I adore. The case and all of the other components was designed to fit this theme of black and gold. To mount the GPU, I designed and printed brackets that would shift the mounting access to the front face of the unit. This is how I'm able to position the GPU very tight against the mainframe. A flat display port extension was also used. Now, on to everyone's favorite part of building a PC, cable management, said no one ever. As I didn't want to go through the hassle of making custom length cables, I had to spend extra time fitting the stock cables into the available spacing. This is where the cover plate comes in handy as you can conceal most of the mess behind it, out of sight, out of mind. With that sorted, the rear panel can be screwed back on, followed by securing the power supply. The build is now complete. Let's enjoy some b-roll of this beautiful case.
The hard drive temperatures don't exceed 40 degrees, so I think we should be fine. But I'll continue to monitor um, in the warmer months. I'll be posting more pictures of the build on my Instagram at mxc underscore builds. So drop a follow if you'd like to see more of that. It was really challenging building with new methods, but I'm really happy with how the end result turned out and I hope you liked it as well. Leave a like and consider subscribing so you don't miss my next videos. As always, I'd like to thank you for watching till the end and I'll see you in the next one.